All right, Jim Nagy's here. He's the executive director of the Senior Bowl in Mobile, one of the best events on the NFL calendar. What's going on, man? Hey, Kevin. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I'm excited for you to be on. I want to start here. So Brett Veach and a couple other GMs, he's not the first person to, to, to make this observation. And actually, I'll go back five years, which is Kevin Colbert, the Steelers GM, was lamenting how young the league had gotten. Because everybody came in the league after three years. Anybody with NFL potential was jumping after three years because they wanted to start to start the clock on their second NFL deal. There was no incentive for them to stay in college. The difference between being a fifth round pick and a third round pick wasn't massive. And all of a sudden, two things were happening. One, guys were coming in more raw. And two, the college product was being hurt. That is completely flipped with NIL. And Beach showed the other day, the number of older prospects has been, frankly, incredible. Um, and I think you're seeing probably literally hundreds of guys stay in. The stats are incredible. Uh, they, they wouldn't have otherwise. And you're talking about top 15 guys, Fashanu coming back an extra year and saying, hey, it's because I love the, I think you said he loved the ice cream shops in State College too much. It's like <laughs> I, I think there might be some other reasons, that, <laughs> other things he loved that, 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 that kept him kept him there a year uh, financially, but that's just the way it goes. In this draft climate, Jim, um, what has NIL done to the evaluation process in the draft? Yeah, it's a it's an interesting dynamic, and you 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 hit it. I mean, these guys are staying in. Um, I think the best the the best impact of NIL positive impact is that guys are no longer making bad football decisions to mm-hmm. take care of something off the field, right? Like, you know, some of these guys come from really tough life life circumstances, and uh, they used to even if they knew they were going to be a late round pick or a undrafted free agent. They made the jump because, you know, they had to help keep the water on or the, light, the lights on. Um, and now they're not doing that. And we've and we've seen it. We've seen it this year, um, you know, because through the Senior Bowl invite process, we'll have guys, the majority of it done in, in November, early December. But it's a it's a it's a rough sport. Right. So these guys get hurt in bowl games and late mm-hmm. in the season. And so we have guys with withdraw. Um, and so then when we went to kind of, you know, backfill the roster, those guys, had, all those, there was a, a ton of day three players. Um, the guys that we had solid, like fifth and sixth round grades on, went back to school. You know, they either transferred. Um, and at that point, I can't reach out to Lincoln Riley, um, mm-hmm. who has a running back from Mississippi State. We liked. You know, he's already got him in the portal. I can't. I can't do that. Um, right. <laughs> so we, we we saw it dry up. Um, I think it's going to make for an interesting draft this year on day three. If I were a team, like I probably wouldn't want to have a lot of day three picks this year. Because I think there's a clear – I think the first four rounds are going to be really strong, probably as strong as we've, we've seen in a long time. Um, but like I said, our, our, our day three really dried up. I think teams are going to be drafting off their – what we used to call our sideboard or our backboard, mm. um, which was mostly you know undrafted free agent level players. And I do – Kevin and I – Kevin Colbert and I used to talk about that a lot. I think it's really helped in the evaluation process. Yep. And if you, if you talk to guys in the league where they've made their mistakes and where – I mean, I look back on my time in the league where I made mistakes personally or teams that I worked for, um, you're missing more on the person than the, than the player. I heard Chris Ballard say it in his press conference the other yeah. day and from a mature, and it's, it goes back to the maturity for the most part. Um, and these guys just aren't ready for the lifestyle. They're not ready for the transition. And so to get an older group of players, um, they can handle it. And I, I see a lot of analytical models like that really like the younger player. And I understand that. I think we got to adjust those models a little bit because these guys are playing longer too, right? Yep. I mean, these, these guys are all taking way better care of themselves than they were when I got into this, you know, 25 years ago. I mean, these guys are playing into their, into their mid thirties, regardless of position. So, yep. um, yeah, man, sorry to be long winded on that first question. No, no, that's what we like here. I mean, it's, it's interesting because I remember d- talking to guys, especially position coaches, maybe five years ago, and they were saying the trap these guys are falling into, they get they, their third round picks and then they're not ready. They need a couple of years of seasoning. All of a sudden, you get cut by the regime that, that, that drafted you. Nobody cares about you. You're out of the league in, in three and a half years. It's over. And, and I think that's what's, what's incredible now because the first contract is so important for valuation. And you need to hit in those first three years. Now these guys are coming in. I mean, I think I, I use this example all the time. A guy like Braden Fisk, who's, who's older than a normal uh, draft entrant, who used the portal, um, he's going to come in NFL ready. And I think that, that be, becoming an, uh, coming in NFL ready is as important as it ever was. I want to ask you kind of, as an offshoot of that, how you think the portal has changed things? Because I've seen it in a bunch of different ways. I think most evaluators see it as a net good because unless you're just – I'm not going to – 
harp on it, but like Jordan Addison, I, there wasn't any reason for him to, to, to transfer to, like from a football standpoint, he did. And that was his decision, all that stuff. But I think the biggest thing that the portal is opening up is guys changing levels, going from G5 to power five, going from Albany and Jared versus case to, to the ACC. Um, that to me has opened up a lot of things. The quarterbacks who were able to play instead of riding the bench. And I've said this on the show 15 times, if Matt Castle were born in 2000, he would have gone and played for, um, for Oregon state instead of, instead of riding the pine at USC, there would have been better evaluation for him. I'm curious now that we know what the portal looks like, how you think that's changing everything, Jim? Yeah, that's a, that's a big one. Um, I was in New England when we drafted Matt, and I want I want to say he threw like seventeen passes that senior. Year. He was <laughs> he was he was running down on kickoff team. They were playing him at tight end. I mean, it was it was insane. Um, so a couple things with with the portal. I think uh, I'm thinking about upstairs where our board is right now. Like we've added uh, a new thing on the card. So when you look at it, you got the player's headshot, and then you got height, weight, speed, like normal NFL board tags. Mm-hmm. But we've added the previous school with like arrows to the new school. So I, so, <laughs> so, so like, so like visually, I know the path of these guys and where yeah. they come from. Um, a couple things. Yes. I think we're seeing traditionally, like we always referred to small school players as FCS and, you know, anything sub FBS. So yeah. FCS D2, D3. We're to the point now where like group of five, our small school players, you know, we used to have anywhere between 10 and 14 small school players in the senior bowl. Um, and just over the last two years, that number has been cut in half. I think this year we may have had six. So like Quinion Mitchell from Toledo, who's probably going to be the first corner taken was in our game, you know, it's kind of a prove it week for him. Um, but he's like a small school guy for us now, a group of five, you know, group of five guy, um, from an evaluation standpoint, I think it's really cleaned it up. Um, I think you're seeing players transfer because they want to get in a new scheme sometimes, a new opportunity. Um, And from the background part, like, again, trying to hit on the person and figure out the person rather than just having one building full of full of, you know, sources to to help figure these guys out. Now it's a second building, sometimes a third building. And then the other aspect of it, too, is all the volatility, volatility and movement Mm -hmm. at the coaching level. You know, Mm -hmm. like you used to go into, you know, pick a power five school and you had a head coach that had been in place forever. His staff was in place. Um, and, and so, like, they were, there was only one group of coaches that knew that player. Now, with the volatility, you could go into a, a really good power program, and they've been through four wideouts coaches in four years. Um, so you've, yeah. got four, you've got four different coaches that have, that have touched these wideouts. So, um, you know, long story short, I think it's cleaned up the evaluation for the teams. I think you'll see, you'll see probably, hopefully, see less misses than ever before. Yep. Um, and they're playing more football too. That's the most important thing. It's interesting. You mentioned the the coaching. The one thing I have maybe a long-term worry about is that with the way rosters are constructed, that recruiting and, and roster management gets so important that the coaches and position coaches end up having different jobs than they did five years ago. And it almost becomes a little bit like what college basketball has become, where it's literally just this guy knows this pipeline, knows, knows this agent, and then it becomes a little different. I, I'm not too worried about that because I do think from an athlete's right standpoint, the portal and NIL are good. Um, but it's just one, one sort of existential, uh, layer that I, that I, I kind of have a little bit, um, switching gears a little bit, Jim, I want to ask you this time of year, you're not a journalist. You're not trying to, to, you know, report, you know, this, you know, the Ravens are looking to do this, but I'm curious, like everyone calls this lying season or lying week. Is it? I, I sometimes I talk to people and they're like, "Well, we don't even ask like our friends in the league." There's almost like a code, like we're not going to say like who do you like or whatever. But like, what kind of conversations happen on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of a draft week where guys are just BSing? And it's, I'm not talking about trade talk or whatever. Just like industry gossip on what is actually happening in the draft. How do guys in the league talk this time of year outside the buildings? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question, and that's kind of how I am, Kevin. Like at yeah. this point, like I don't even try to pry into their business. Yeah. I I respect them. Um, when you see me post some things on Twitter, it's based on. Um, I don't think a lot of people realize this. Like we had eleven former NFL scouts on our staff this year, so it's important to me that we do our own work. But what happens before we send the actual invites and get to that point? We get we hop on calls with about half the league. You know, usually it's fourteen, fifteen, sixteen teams, and they're exhaustive, like three hour long calls. And that's when we do the grade sharing. You know, that's where te- and teams yeah. are really open at that point. You know, like for Braden Fisk, for instance, you know, the Florida State defensive tackle. I mean, back back in November, most teams had fourth and fifth round grades on them. So for him to be here, probably not getting out of the second, maybe sneaking into the first, that's a massive jump. 
Now, in, and I have conversations with guys coming out of Senior Bowl too, but when we get this close, I kind of leave that alone. Yeah. Um, the conversations I have in the spring are usually like for the quarterbacks, because I know I'm going to get asked about the quarterbacks. I'll reach out to teams that don't have a clear quarterback need right. to, to, to get their take. But but mostly it's just like, man, you know, Hayes in the barn, you know, how are you guys feeling about it? Um, we're talking more about like family stuff and yeah, you know, of off season, like what you're going to be doing after the draft is over. Where are you going on vacation? Um, but I don't try to tr- pry into their stuff too much. They're all go- every time I ask an NFL person where they're going, they're going to the Outer Banks. Every single person goes to the Outer <laughs> Banks, or or some parts of Michigan actually. Um, do you think do mo- are most boards set by now, or they set weeks ago? Like, what's the? And I know it's different in in, in everything, but like, I, you know, the coaches have some sort of say in it, and there's rising and falling. But like, are, are most boards set at this point? Yeah, they should be. Yeah, at this point, absolutely. Now you're. Now you're just talking strategy. You're calling your teams, and it's usually like the upper level decision maker guys are calling their buddies, um, casting a wide net in their network, right? And then talking about trade scenarios and hey, we're looking to move here. This is what, you know, you're talking about movable pieces at this point. Strategy. It, it should be said. And you're right. When you hear about the fluctuations in the, you know coming out of pro day season, it's exactly what you said about the coaches getting involved in the process. You know, like <laughs> and most teams don't weigh those guys down with too much. I mean, if if you got if you, you'll give each position coach the teams I've worked for, you know, maybe 10 guys to look at. And then you'll call them into the, the draft room and you'll go over those guys and why they like them. And and that that can that can create some shifts on the board. But outside of that, from a personnel staff, you should be pretty locked in at this point. Uh, give me something. We'll start with Drake May, because we the reason we had to push this two hours was because we had Drake May just a couple of hours ago. The listeners heard that by now. Uh, one thing that maybe I don't appreciate about Drake May that the common viewer does not appreciate about Drake May that we should know from a scout's perspective. His short game in golf. He doesn't use a wedge. He, he, put, he, put, he puts <laughs> I everything. I told him that. You've outed yourself as a source. I told him that I had a source who said that there, there, there was a Texas wedge. And now I'm glad that we have, we have this. We have a name. We have a name on the scouting report, Jim. That and it, it, so we, we he was down here training for the pre-draft stuff. So he and Bo Nix, we all, you know, Carter Bradley from South Alabama. We went out and swung it with uh, one day here. And that's the other thing was so he 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 dry he hit he tees off with iron for the first seven holes doesn't even pull the driver out and then pull the driver out on eight and and out drove the green on a par four that I've never seen anyone reach with drivers so he he's a big hitter but like the whole when he's putting from seventy five yards out it's kind of crazy to to see um, but I'll say this about Drake so to the evaluation part the football part um, yeah. you know some people are picking him apart accuracy wise. And uh, I went over there before the senior bowl, watched those guys work out. They, they, they were taking some video of it. We went inside and watched the video of the workout and they did a close up of like waist down, lower body mechanic stuff. And uh, this is just me, me being stupid. I wasn't even thinking. I'm like, man, Drake, you got great feet. Did you play basketball? And uh, <laughs> forgetting that he's from the May yeah. basketball yep. family. Right. Yep. And he, and he was polite. He didn't like, didn't call me out. And he's like, yeah, I, I played some hoops. I'm like, were you one of those guys that quit in middle school to focus on football or did you play your all way, whole way through? And then at some point, someone else in the room was like, Jim, his whole family played yeah. at UNC. Of yeah. course he played basketball. Yeah. But you know, if, if you're picking it, I'll say this, if you're picking apart his accuracy, um, like people do with Josh Allen, if you're dealing with a good enough athlete, you can clean some of that stuff up. And he's got such unbelievable feet for a big guy. And I, I was always trained, you know, you start with quarterback evals with the feet. Um, so if, for the people out there knocking him or, or concerned about that, I think, I think that's something he's going to get better at. Tickets to the game, merch, meals at iconic restaurants, stays at Caesars Palace. All this can be yours when you bet with Caesars Sportsbook. Win or lose, every bet earns reward credits, which you can redeem across the empire. Now, if you haven't started yet, use the code Omaha full, and then Place your first bet up to $1,250. If you win, great. You keep those winnings. But if you lose, you get your stake back as a bonus bet. Compare Caleb Williams to, and at broad strokes, we don't need to go through 50 quarterbacks here, but <laughs> I think the three quarterbacks that stand out in the last 15 years are Andrew Luck, Trevor Lawrence, Caleb Williams. Do you see it as... That one, two, three, like how, how do you view it as far as let, let's let's use a reductive term, the generational quarterback prospects that have come out in the last 15 years. How do you see those? And is that the conversation in, in your mind or are there other people that need to be included in that? Well, Andrew Luck is, is the best one I've done. 
um, yeah. coming out. You know, he and, and digging way back, probably going back to like Roethlisberger, Rivers. Yeah. Um, were a couple guys I did, but again, they weren't, Andrew was thought of that guy, right? Every Andrew was a slam dunk. Everyone thought of that with Andrew. Caleb, he, you know, when you talk about Andrew Luck, he checked every box. I mean, every mm-hmm. single box. It's hard for me now in, in my role because I'm not in the school. I don't know the background stuff as much. All I see is the peripheral stuff that, you know, mm-hmm. has already been dissected, you know, about Caleb and he's been picked apart for a lot of things in terms of potentially maybe his makeup. I'm not even going to comment on that. But the guys that you feel really good about that are slam dunks kind of check every box. Um, so it's hard. But, yes, all I can say is we had like we had Brennan Rice in the senior bowl. We had Marshawn Lloyd in the yep. senior bowl. Um, so I, I watched plenty of offensive tape and he clearly has a wow factor, man. You, I mean, all the arm angle stuff, all the Mahomes comparisons like there is there is that. I do think the only other thing I'd add, I do think he's a really good athlete. Like he's a little bit mm-hmm. like Jameis. Like Jameis was a little wonky mm-hmm. in terms of like. He didn't look pretty when he got outside the pocket, but, you know, and, and but he was a Jameis could could beat you with his legs at Florida State. And, and Caleb's the same way. Like he's not a not a great, graceful athlete um, like right. like Jaden's prettier when he when he pulls the ball down. Um, but he's effective, man. He's a, he's a, he's a really good athlete. So, um, again, compared to those other guys, I wish I could do it, man. But but he is he makes you he makes you rewind the tape a bunch. There, that's for sure. All right, let's do some story time. We'll start here. Best GM you ever worked for? Oof, man, you put me on the spot, my kid. <laughs> well, um, you know, again, I can. Bill Belichick was our yeah. quote unquote GM, but Scott Pioli, I worked for Scott yeah, for 13 years. So I, I, I owe my career to Scott. Um, and then John Schneider in Seattle. Of course. Um, I consider one of my, my best friends. He, I was a, an intern in Green Bay when he was a young pro personnel assistant. I used to go up there. We had six future GMs on that staff in Green Bay, but most of them were out on the road. John yeah. and Reggie McKenzie were in the office. So every chance I got um, as an intern, I would go up there and, and there, I, I probably pestered those guys too much, but they'd let me come in and watch tape with them. Um, so John was unbelievable to work for. The culture he set in Seattle, I mean, everyone loved working there. I mean, it really, yeah. it was, that's why it was hard to leave and, and come here to the Senior Bowl because that really was a great place to work. All right, we'll go through it. Um, first thing is obviously being a scout for Belichick is a different deal. It's not like you're on the coaching staff, um, and and there's all sorts of stuff with with the chain of command and stuff. But is there anything Bill or that Patriot system taught you about football that in a million years you never would have thought of? Where it's just like, oh wait, I get it. Like obviously you're going to know he's a great football mind, but when you're that up close to it, is there something where you point to where you're like, holy crap? Yeah, there was a lot of observational learning, as I like to call it, when you were in New England. You weren't included all the time as a scout and some of the, you know, we got smaller. As the draft got closer, the room got, the room, the, it was a tighter <laughs> circle. The circle of, the circle of trust uh, yeah. condensed. So, um, but you could learn a lot. And I, I think the biggest thing I took from my time in New England um, was just the the emphasis on position versatility and intelligence. Yeah. Um, you know, again, Seattle was completely different. That's the value of getting outside the tree. And I went from like the Parcells tree to the to the, you know, Ron Wolf tree um, and two very different. That's why New England, New England fans. I mean, you're, you're getting ready with Elliot Wolf to enter in a, into a completely different way of doing things. Uh, but in New England, you're really stressing football intelligence and guys that could could learn multiple spots. And like I always go back to Troy Brown. The year Troy was, you know, a great slot receiver before Welker, before Edelman. It, it was Troy. He was kind of the the, the model. Um, but that one year, I forget what year it was, 2003, 04, mm-hmm. uh, we get crushed in the secondary. And Troy goes yeah. over and plays slot corner. I don't think he'd played it since high school. And he, he had three picks down the stretch in December 4. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's the biggest takeaway from New England. It's just really digging down into the football intelligence. And if you look at, like, you know, the guys that have come from there, Nick Casario, like Houston Texans are a huge football intelligence team. When they're at the senior bowl, every one of their scouts has a, has a, you know, an iPad on them and they got the film loaded up for every player. And if you see them sitting down, that's what they're doing. They're going over tape with those guys. Kirby smart revealed that Nick Saban told him and showed him that Bill Belichick stands behind the 40 yard dashes to see players butts and how big they are. Did you have to scout butts for Bill Belichick, Jim? (laughs) uh it was never it was never a directive i'll say that okay. but uh i mean if you're a scout you if you're a scout that's what you do man i mean that's that's part it sounds weird but that's kind of part of what you do i mean um you can see explosion in a player um sure. through the rear end for sure 
<laughs> what a phrase. What a phrase. Um, all right, we do something called uh, one rep back for players. It's uh, a play they'd like to have back. For evaluators, we say, hey, one scouting report back. A guy you just either didn't see it in or saw it and it didn't work. Brandon Bean said he wishes he saw it. He was on a couple weeks ago. He says he wishes he saw it in Puka Nakua. He just didn't see it. In all your scouting reports, when you're inside buildings, Jim, who's the guy where you're like, would love to redo that report? Well, this came up today in an earlier podcast, and I'll use a senior bowl example here, okay. Bryce Huff. Um, so oh. Bryce Huff, the pass rusher from the Jets, just took the signed the biggest, biggest undrafted free agent deal in the history of the National Football League. This guy is from Mobile, Alabama, went to St. Paul's High School, which is, you know, a quarter of a mile from my house. Uh, we had a scouting assistant on the staff that year that was Bryce Huff's teammate in high school, oh and gosh. we didn't invite him to the Senior Bowl. So that was uh, that was a whiff. You know, like our goal every year is to get every player drafted. It doesn't work out that way. We have our misses. Um, and, and, you know, Bryce didn't come out really good on those November right. phone calls I was telling you about. So we didn't invite him against – I whiffed. I, I, I wish I could have that one back. I'm so happy for Bryce that he's had this great career, but I completely whiffed on that one. Now we can fly private to the Senior Bowl and just check it out if he needs to. He can get back to Mobile that way. Um, last thing for you, we call it badasses. The most badass person you've ever been around in football. Now, this could also be a GM. It could be a coach. But typically, it's a player that somebody played with who was just an absolute badass who was in the building every day doing wild stuff in the weight room or on the field. Who do you got, Jim? I would say the biggest, and there's a lot now because I was lucky. I was around those Legion of Boom defenses in Seattle and some really good players in in, uh, in New England as well. I'd probably go with Rodney Harrison. Uh, oh. Rodney Harrison, to me, we got him. You know, that was back when he was leaving the Chargers. I know that it's pretty well documented. He said the Chargers kind of gave up on him. And so he yep. came to New England with a massive chip on his shoulder. And he just walked around. like He had a body made for contact. Like you would see Rodney walking out to two days and – practices in August, you know, carrying his shoulder pads and helmets. And he just looked like he could run through a brick wall. And that's kind of how he played. Like he was just made for contact. So to see those, all those old NFL films, videos where he's just talking, talking (laughs) and and getting in people's faces, like that's who Rodney, to me, Rodney was, Rodney's the biggest badass. And what people, I think what gets overlooked with Rodney, um, I'd I'd have to, you might want to fact check me here, but I want to say there was like, there was an eight-game run in the playoffs that he played for the Patriots that he forced a fumble in, in seven of the eight games, which is an incredible stat when you get to playoff time that you're turning the ball over like that. So incredible player, but uh, to me it'd be him or Cam Chancellor. Those are two, two dudes in a dark alley I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to face. Quickly, if you have a minute, a Cam Chancellor story. Uh, yeah, I mean, Cam was just kind of like the, the, the silent, silent assassin. So I'll say yeah. that my quick Cam story, everyone's seen Cam play. The story I always remember was uh, back in the, back in the day, um, you know, you could only have I think it was sixty guys at the combine to interview for mm-hmm. fifteen minutes. Well, some teams kind of cheated, right? Like, the, the, I was in Kansas City. Scott Pioli had a relationship with the Miami Dolphins and, and that crew, with Parcells crew. So they would Dolphins would send a guy to our room, and I would go to the Dolphins' room. And so we were in there. Cam was in the room, and this is the day Frank Beamer would not talk. It, 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 he shut his building down. So Frank Beamer got burned by a player. Um, I won't go into that, but basically a team told the, told a, one of his players that, hey, man, that, you know, you're exactly what Vatek said you were. And, you know, you're, you're not on time. You're undependable. And the player was like, really? <laughs> so he went back to Vatek and then mm-hmm. Coach Beamer shut it down. Um, so when you were as a scout, like it was hard to go in and get information for Vatek. So we're sitting, we're sitting, you had to find your ways. You know, we all find our ways as scouts to figure it out. Well, I'm sitting in this interview with the Dolphins with Cam Chancellor, and they try to catch him off guard, which a lot of teams do. They, they try to catch these dudes off guard. And they were like, you know, Cam, they say this about you. They say this about you. And he was so rattled that like in that interview, like he, it was, he was like, oh my gosh, they say that about me. That's what they say about me. I had to follow him out in the in the train station and, and grab me like, Cam, listen, I was through Vatek three times. They do not say that about you. Um, I didn't want him going because they didn't. They, You know, the people you could get to love Cam Chancellor. Um, but he was a stud, man. I mean, that's just one wow. little insight. But he was he was totally rattled by that conversation. But uh, it was I felt very fortunate to link up my last five years in league with Cam that I'll never forget that Super Bowl. I mean, uh, Malcolm Malcolm Smith won the MVP of that game. What Cam what Cam did as an enforcer, like knocking Welker out on those shallow crossers and setting the tone early. You could have given Cam the MVP of that Super Bowl just for what he was as an intimidator.
I completely agree. The Dolphins are on notice for, for 15 years ago lying to Cam Chancellor, but that's <laughs> that's another day. Jim, thank you so much for coming to this football, man. We'll see you soon. Yeah, thanks for having me on. That was fun.